Thank you, Bell Choir. So happy to have the new choir season starting up again. Welcome to our worship service this morning. Our focus today is going to be on Jesus' parable of the undeserving manager and the way that that parable unfolds for us today. So we'll be listening for that in the service. A couple of announcements. Our Bible studies have restarted again. I encourage everyone to find a Bible study, get involved in one of the small groups. That's the best way to get to know each other and get involved with each other here in the life of our congregation at Emmanuel. And then coming up on Friday, and this is for all ages, we have our game night taking place. And uh, that's been a fun thing we've been doing throughout the summer. And I hope to see you out and uh, maybe, we'll, maybe we'll play some chess. Yes? Yeah, we've been learning some chess. Uh, looking forward to seeing folks out for game night on Friday. With those announcements made, we'll have the ringing of the bell followed by our opening hymn. God bless your worship this morning.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. The congregation may kneel. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto Thee that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against thee by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore we plead for refuge to thine infinite mercy, seeking and imploring thy grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who has given thine only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins. And by thy Holy Spirit, Increase in us true knowledge of thee and of thy will, and through obedience to thy word, that by thy grace we may come to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, hath had mercy upon us, and hath given his only Son to die for us, and for his sake forgiveth us all our sins. To them that believe on his name, he giveth power to become the sons of God, and bestoweth upon them his Holy Spirit. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, O Lord, unto us all. Congregation may rise. Behold, O God, our shield, and look upon the face of thine anointing, for day in thy courts is better than a thousand. How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts, my soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord.
be with you. Let us pray. Keep, we beseech thee, O Lord, thy church with thy perpetual mercy, and because the frailty of man without thee cannot but fall, keep us ever by thy help from all things hurtful, and lead us to all things profitable to our salvation. Through thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Please be seated. Our Old Testament reading for the 15th Sunday after Pentecost is from the prophet Amos, the 8th chapter, beginning at the 4th verse. <coughs> and in this reading, the prophet is warning us about mistreatment of the poor. Hear this, you who trample on the needy and bring the poor of the land to an end, saying, When will the new moon be over, that we may sell grain? And the Sabbath, that we may offer wheat for sale? that we may make the ephah small and the shekel great, and deal deceitfully with false balances, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and sell the chaff of the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their deeds. Here ends our Old Testament reading.
Thank you, Belfire. How great indeed is our God. And yet, hear the Apostle Paul in our epistle reading, 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning at the first verse, is teaching us to call upon him and that Jesus Christ is the mediator between God and mankind. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Here ends our epistle reading. Pray now our gradual responsibly. It is better to put trust in the Lord. It is better to trust in the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place. In all generations, alleluia. According to St. Luke, the 16th chapter, beginning at the first verse. This reading, Jesus is telling to his disciples and the Pharisees the parable of the dishonest manager. Jesus said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, What shall I do, since my master is taking the management away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors, one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, A hundred measures of oil. He said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. And he said to another, And how much do you owe? He said, A hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. Master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give to you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other cannot serve God and money. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts, for what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Here ends the Gospel for today. the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We sing our sermon hymn. Please be seated. Please rise. The text for our message this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, the 16th chapter, and focused in on the 11th verse, where Jesus says, If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? This is the word of God. Please be seated.
Well, back in 1977, the BBC aired a documentary that made quite an impression on people at that time and is still making an impression upon us today. It, uh, that show has run in Britain. It runs also here in America. It's called Antiques Roadshow, and maybe you've seen it at one time or another. It's, it's, uh, it's given a rise to a variety of these kinds of shows where they bring in experts and they look look over things and try to figure out what their value is, just how valuable those things can be. And sometimes the things are rather unimportant and maybe even, well, worthy of the, of the trash bin. <laughs> and other times, though, they are truly riches that are discovered. In our text this morning, Jesus is telling a parable, a parable that gets us thinking all about value and also the values in our lives. Before considering our riches, though, let's take a more careful look at Jesus' parable and what it's trying to say to us. Now, we've had uh, a sermon series here, all with parables from Luke for, I think, four weeks now. And some of the parables are rather easy to discern and to, to understand how they came about and, and how Jesus is using them. But this parable, the parable of the dishonest manager, is not like the others. It's different. Jesus is, seems to be encouraging bad behavior with this parable. It's, it's unusual in that respect. He seems to be telling his disciples to make friends and to have access, even access into the heavenly places, by using unrighteous wealth. What on earth could Jesus mean by saying these things? Can the holy, righteous, even sinless Lord Jesus Christ be encouraging us to live this way, to approach the true God in this way? Well, to get a clearer picture of what's going on with this unusual parable, I invite you to look at the picture on the front of your bulletins for just a moment. Have a look at the picture there. It's by an artist named uh, James Tissot, who did lots of Holy Land illustrations. And these are the figures that you see there. Of course, Jesus is at the center of that picture. And they're seated below him as a group of men, and these are the disciples gathered to hear the teachings of Jesus. And then if you look to the back in the right-hand side, you see another group, and this is the Pharisees. The Pharisees and the scribes who come out to listen to Jesus' teaching. And the story here in the parable speaks as a warning to the disciples, but Jesus is also speaking to those Pharisees who have gathered to hear. I'll illustrate this from the Gospel itself. Uh, Luke chapter 15, verse 1, at the beginning of these parables, this is what Luke records. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, <coughs> saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. That's how the parable series starts out. And then St. Luke records this today at the end of the parables. Verse 14 of chapter 16. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things and they ridiculed Jesus. So you see, they were, they were understanding that what Jesus was saying was speaking not just to those disciples gathered there, but was speaking to them. Jesus wants the disciples to be shrewd. And that's the point he makes for them with the parable. But he's also speaking a warning to those Pharisees because they are the dishonest managers focused on money, focused on unrighteous wealth as Jesus addresses them in this parable. The disciples, we as disciples, need to understand Jesus wants us to be shrewd. He wants us to manage our money, our affairs, in a good way, in a reasonable way. But then Jesus says in verse 11, 
that he wants us to seek after true riches. True riches. Often on that antiques road show, when they're assessing these different items that are brought in, it's not the price or the, the, that is the real value of the item that has come in. It's not the money that they would receive if they sold it. For often for those owners, it's something much more. The meaning of that piece in their family, they value it and treasure it in a very different way. There's a wealth of meaning that they attach to some of these items that money simply cannot buy. And folks, it's similar with you this morning. You who have gathered here in God's house, you have gathered to this special place to receive something that is a true treasure, a true rich riches as Jesus describes it here, that life-giving word of God. It doesn't cost that much to go out and buy the Bible, but it's the life-giving word. The bread and wine we use in the sacrament, not terribly expensive, but they are a treasure and communicate to us the riches of the kingdom of heaven. The Lord spoke through about these gifts, these true treasures to you for many years through faithful managers of God's house here. Pastor Sutorius and Pastor Stolzenberg brought you these gifts and blessings, these true riches of God's kingdom. And that is how you have received and inherited these benefits. I was pleased this week to pay a visit to one of our newest shut-ins here at Emmanuel. I was overseeing Don Ball's new apartment where he was. And as I was talking with Don, he started talking about his time here as a choir director. He played the organ, the piano, and how he taught people to sing. And, and that's a treasure of God's house, isn't it? The, the music of God's house those sacred gifts, and, and Don was just reveling in the memories of those blessings that he got to manage as a faithful stewards of the gifts of God and to share with you as God's dearly loved people. And then Don and I started talking about the experience of moving of leaving his home and moving into this apartment, the new place, and how he, he was saying he, he felt uncomfortable about it at first. And then his son and his daughter came, and they brought things from the house, his, his, his bed, his table, his, his chairs. They, they brought the pictures that lined his wall. They get a lot of them. Uh, the son did a great job putting them up, a wonderful collage there on the wall. And Don said that after those items, those treasures of his family, of his memory, of his life, were brought into that new place, how differently the room felt and became for him. Treasures of the heart, treasures that speak to our mind, to our will, to our lives. Don is in a new place, but the family has filled his life with those familiar blessings that make a home. Jesus chastises the Pharisees because of their love of unrighteous well, because they have failed to seek after the true riches, the true blessings. And he teaches his disciples to treasure those above all things. They're the very things we've just been mentioning. Uh, our baptism into Christ, the Holy Sacrament, the Word of God, sacred music. These things that minister to our hearts, our minds, our lives. These are the true riches of the kingdom of God. And yet... I'm going to tell you a story that takes all of this 
in a new direction, a new way. And it's a story that comes from the early centuries of the church. There was a minister back in those days by the name of, what well, we call him today, St. Lawrence. And as Lawrence was serving his congregation, one day some ruffians came, robbers came to the church there and they told Lawrence, we are coming back on such and such a day and we want you to bring out to us the treasures of the church. We're taking our cut. We're taking our share. And so the day came and these robbers returned. And they said, where's the treasure? And Lawrence brought out to them the sick and the lame, the blind and the poor. And he said to those robbers who were only concerned about unrighteous wealth, these, these people are the treasure of the church. Folks, I want you to catch that sense this morning. You, you are the treasure of God's house. As valuable as anything else might be in this building, it's you that are the treasure of God's church and of the kingdom of God. Just yesterday, I was sitting with a, a group here at the church. We're working on our history. Uh, we're going to have our anniversary. You're going to be getting a, a card in the mail saying, save the date. We've got our 125th anniversary coming up next September here at Emmanuel. And we were talking about this wonderful building, the place you're sitting at. It's 100 years old, this part of the building. And it was designed by a prominent Ohio architect, a guy by the name of Frank Packard. And Packard also designed one of the governor's homes here in the state of Ohio. He's, he's, uh, he's, he's a very capable, well-respected art, uh, artist. Well, uh, yeah, artist is right. And this sanctuary is a part of his handiwork. We've been talking about having this as a, a national historic place, being registered that way. But as we've talked to the historians, this has been a part of the conversation. Yeah, Packard made an incredible building here, but you have changed, well, we've changed the altar area. We changed the lighting here in the building. See the ceiling over your heads here? That's been added. And uh, above it is the air conditioning, and I say thanks be to God, okay? I hope you're with me on that. <laughs> uh, we moved pews over here to make room for the piano. We've added a narthex and an elevator. And as much of a treasure as this building is, and as much as it is worthy to be a national historic place, the congregation, made those changes with you in mind. Because folks, no matter how valuable this property is, the treasure and the church is the people, the congregation, gathered to our Lord Jesus Christ, gathered to his gifts in this place. That's the real treasure of God's church so valued by our God that he sent his only begotten son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to lay down his life for us upon the cross to redeem us with that precious and holy blood of Jesus. We might be his dearly loved people. Emmanuel is a living treasure valued by our Lord. You are that living treasure. And as you leave the place this week, I encourage you to take that attitude and heart with you of God's treasuring you and also to share and invite others to come and hear these truths, the true riches 
kingdom of God for his dear people. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue with our offering. Dispenser of God's store, O Spirit, bear our offerings home. Lord, make us thine forevermore. Amen. Let the children come forward. talking in the sermon about Antiques Roadshow and about valuing things, and we're going we're gonna to do that for just a minute. I've got, uh, I've got here with me two crosses, one I'm wearing and one I'm holding here. Put those over. Tell me, which one do you think might be the more valuable cross? This one? Yeah. yeah. You think that one? Why do you think that one? Because it's Jesus on it. Oh, good. <laughs> good morning. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> so, so yeah, the, the people at the road show might look at that and, and they might say, well, this one's more valuable because, because this one is silver. That one has silver. This one's pewter. Not nearly as valuable. But you made a good point there, Hart. Because this one also, not just being silver, also shows us our Lord Jesus Christ and the blessings and gifts that he won for us when he was on the cross. Now, let me ask you this. What do you think is the most valuable thing here in this building? Okay. Yeah, this kid, she, you should be on the show. You should be calling the, calling the values here. Yeah, it to replace the replacement value of the windows in this building probably would run into the millions of dollars. Yeah. Yeah, and yet, as, as we learn from Jesus, that's not the true treasure of the church. But the people are. And the word and the sacrament through which God blesses and cares for his people, those are the true riches of God's house. All right. Good to have you come up today. If you'd like to take a snack back, you're welcome.
species. to kneel for prayer. Lord God Almighty, you know our desire for ease and well-being. Help us look up from our table of plenty to see those in need of bread for the day. O loving Lord, help us share the faith. Heavenly Father, you let us own poverty for our time on earth as a trust and as a sign of your presence among us. We give you thanks for entrusting us to be stewards of all that you have created. May we honor you with all of our goods. O loving Lord, Holy Spirit, keep us from believing that security comes from our wealth. You, Lord, are our only hope our guide in the day of darkness, and our deliverance on the day of departing, all for which we give you our heartfelt thanks. O loving Lord, we ask, dear Lord, that you would have mercy upon the following persons, Andrea and Kirk Anthem, Hope Armstrong, Jack Ashcraft, Evelyn Holliday, Patty Palmer, Grant Barron, Danny Maynard, Larry Middendorf, Joan Casson, Sarah Schock, Joel Siddle, Margaret Stevenson, Terry Wells Taylor, Sienna Tobias, Sherry Wyland, Dean Woodyard, Jim Young, Mary, and the Adams as they are struggling against COVID and all those affected by that illness. 
pray, O Lord our God, that you would deliver your people. Grant them grace in their hour of need. We ask your blessing upon the, the family of Pat Biddle Wilsh, who has passed from this life into your nearer presence. We pray that you would comfort them and encourage them in the hope of the resurrection of the life everlasting. We ask your blessing on the following households of Emmanuel, Nasser, Newsom, Nirmi, Hassan, Peacock, Phillips, Pottig, and Paul, that they would prosper under your care and guidance. We praise you this day, dear Lord, for the 58th wedding anniversary of Monroe and Roseanne Carbage. Give them joy this day, also as they gather with their families, we ask a similar blessing, dear Lord, for Sandy and Dennis Malloy and Jerry and Diane Barker as they are celebrating their anniversaries of the wedded love that you placed in their hearts. We pray your blessing upon those celebrating birthdays and their families who gather with them, Cassie Branson, Ben Henry, Cooper Brown, Evan Hack, Harley Whiteside, Deanna Maynard, and Candace Clark. Give them joy, O Lord our God, in your gifts and kindness. We ask, dear Lord, that you would grant peace among the warring nations of the earth, especially between Russia and Ukraine. We pray that, that hearts would be changed and the conflicts there may cease. The children may be safe and their families. Hear us now as we pray as Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. <laughs>